So this morning we are very pleased to have Julie Stroud with us and Julie does a lot of consulting work related to benefit analysis related to social security benefits. And I know this is an issue that as case managers we often come up against. Um, you know we have individuals who are wanting to work or are concerned about how changes in their income are going to affect their benefits which then in part they're worried about how that could impact their waiver. So benefit analysis is a super helpful tool that is available, but it's also good for you as case managers to have just a little bit of an understanding about how it works and some of the things that go into it. So Julie, I'm gonna go ahead and make you presenter and you'll see a little thing come up on your screen and then we'll be able to see your screen once you click on it. Okay. All right, we see your screen. So you can go ahead and do your presentation then. Uh, we will do questions at the end. I'm sure there will be quite a few because um, this I know is a really big topic and the benefits, they're definitely, it's not an easy navigating system. So I will turn it over to you, Julie, and thank you very much for presenting today. Thank you. I'm uh, really excited the opportunity to speak to um, all the case managers and the guests. Um, like, you know, I've been doing benefits counseling in Indiana for about 10 years and have been employment specialist in Illinois and Indiana for almost 20 years. So I've worked with a lot of clients with disabilities who are going to work that are receiving benefits and not understanding what happens in the beginning and often that fear causes them to you know not take a job or quit a job the first time their benefits are adjusted so my mission is to give people the information so they can make decisions based on the facts not the fear so i'm excited to be able to give you some information on um the impact work and different life events have on all the different benefits. So you can help the clients know when they need to contact Social Security, uh, Medicaid, food stamps, housing, those type of benefits. Um, and so they don't get in trouble. So let me go ahead and start. Um, I'm gonna start my presentation with an overview of Social Security and different benefits and then describe different work and other life events that have an impact on those benefits. Okay, um, often people call social security disability and they don't realize there's two different types and how work affects those types are different. And so they're talking apples and oranges. And we love that parents talk to each other um, and help each other through the process, but when they're not talking the same thing, they can definitely get in trouble. So the first one, SSDI, is Social Security Disability Insurance. And I always think of the insurance as because what you're paying in for your check. So it's based on work credits. And it could be the um, recipient's work record, it could be a parent's work record, or a deceased spouse's work record. So the amount of that check is based on the past earnings, what they are withheld from their paychecks. And when they go to work, that is an all or nothing check. So people think with that check, oh, I can make $1,000 or you know $1,200 or whatever the amount is every year and still keep my check. And that is true for that check. But the other check that also people think about is your social security disability because it comes from the social security office and it's based on their disability, but that's SSI, that's supplemental security income. So I always think of that I as income. So you have a disability, you need money to live and social security gives you money. But when you have other income, that check changes. So that's a check that actually goes up and down each month. This is when someone hasn't worked at all or they haven't earned enough work credits. The full benefit amount is $794 for a single person or $1,194 for a couple. 
some people's check may be one third less if they're receiving what Social Security says is in-kind support. So that's somebody who's not paying their full um, living expenses. So that happens a lot for young people who are living at home because when they first apply for Social Security, they ask them, are they, you know, the family's giving them money, the family's not charging them rent, because how do you charge rent when you have no money coming in? But when they start receiving SSI, they're starting to contribute to the family income, but they don't know to go back to Social Security and tell them what they're charging, or they're not really charging them enough, and so they're not getting that full benefit amount. Um, and so that's important to know how that works. And I've helped a lot of clients get their full benefit amount once they understand the formula and they charge enough rent. Um, so when they're working with SSI, that check goes up and down each month. And I'll explain that in a couple more slides. Now, actually some people can be a concurrent beneficiary, which means they're receiving both checks. That usually happens, or that only happens, when the SSDI check, which is based on work credits, are not higher than the full benefit amount of SSI. So then they receive an SSI check that supplements that. Um, also, Social Security retirement. Um, I've actually had a client that decided to go ahead and go for early retirement rather than go through the delayed process of applying for Social Security disability. So work does affect Social Security retirement. Um, actually just got a um, question from vocational rehab that someone was receiving widow or widow, widower benefits. So someone may actually be receiving that also. Um, the other thing people are worried about is health insurance, um, Medicare, is one health insurance that be begins after someone is receiving SSDI for 24 months or they've reached 65 years of age. Um, you guys, some of you may already know this, but part A is for hospitalization, part B is your doctor, your therapies, outpatient, and D is your prescription drugs. Now part A has no premium, so somebody gets that for free, but Part B and D does have a premium, although a lot of people are, um, those premiums are paid for by Medicaid or other state programs. Now for Medicaid, um, there are two different type of states. For a long time, Indiana was a 209B state, and that's where people um, would have Medicaid and they'd have a big spend down if they were over income, um, but they would still have Medicaid. Now, I think it was back in like 2014, Indiana changed to a 1634 state, which means that um, if you apply for Medicaid first, it will require you to apply for SSI. Um, and if you are denied by SSI, then you're automatically then terminated for Medicaid. Um, so that's a way that they don't have separate disability determination boards. It's really combined. So that's why a lot of people that apply for Medicaid, they say you have to apply for Social Security. Um, and of course that is if they're over income or resources, then their Medicaid will stop. Um, and of course I don't need to tell you guys about Medicaid waiver. Um, so, oh. Um, other benefits I cover is SNAP, also known as food stamps, TANF, um, not too many of our clients get it, but I have had some, um, cash assistance or welfare, HUD, public housing. Um, they could be in public housing, someone could get a Section 8 voucher, or it could be an income-based apartment. And so all those work affects those. Um, and then the Medicaid residential liability, that's if someone's living in a group home, nursing home, or other institutional facility. And also if the client has any children, their SSDI, SSI, and Medicaid. So I'll cover those benefits also. Um, so the type of life events I cover is starting or stopping a job, including changes to wages or hours. 
that's really important. People think about tele and social security when they start a job, but they don't necessarily go back and tell them when they stop a job. And what often happens is after someone's reporting to social security for a while and their wages are pretty stable, social security will tell the client that they um, do not need to report their earnings anymore unless something changes. And I always say if Social Security has to send, tell you something that they can send in a paragraph, they send it in five pages. And in those five pages, it reminds people that nobody ever reads those five pages, but it says if your wages changes or any of these life events happen, you need to tell Social Security and people don't. So that's why I really wanted to make sure that everybody knew about this because it is important that if your client has something, one of these life events happen, that you are prompting them to tell Social Security and these other agencies. So besides jobs, also moving or any changes to rent or living expenses. Um, again, because that can change their full benefit amount and other things. Um, getting married or divorced or holding yourself out as married. Um, that's an important part. And actually, I just got an email from a vocational rehabilitation counselor. Someone's married, but they're separated. And um, that can make a difference. And I'm going to help that client tell Social Security that they're now separated to see if they can get more of their SSI amount. Because it's a different if you're married. Uh, if someone has a child or their child reaches the age of 18 or leaves school, that is a life event that can change their benefits. Um, a big one that people may not realize is if the parents retire, become disabled, or pass away. That can definitely, even if they're not living with the parents, that can affect their benefits. Or if they receive a large sum of money, whether it's hit the lottery, you know, not so much a back pay, um, a, you know, an inheritance, um, or even changing banks. I've had people change banks and they don't even tell their agencies so then their money's not coming. So that's an important thing. Um, so the impact work has on benefits. I'm going to go into a lot of detail for SSDI and SSI in later slides, but I want to tell people that um, the other benefits. So for Medicare, um, as long as someone's receiving their SSDI check, remember that's the all or nothing check, you're still going to get Medicare. But if they work their way off of benefits and they're no longer receiving SSDI, they can continue to receive Medicare through an extended Medicare coverage. Now, um, Medicaid is usually more tied to SSI. And if someone is still getting SSI, then they're going to stay on Medicaid. But if they end up working their way off of the SSI check, there's something called a 1619B, that's provision of the Social Security Act, and that allows someone to stay on free Medicaid um, with even if their SSI check ends. Also, Indiana has a program called MedWorks. That is a Medicaid buy-in program. So that's somebody who is not receiving SSI or has both. Uh, SSI and SSDI, so they no longer they don't qualify for that 1619B to keep Medicaid even if they're working. They can pay the premium for Medicaid and then keep Medicaid. Now again, I said Medicaid can pay for Medicare premiums, so it's often cheaper to pay the MedWorks premium and have Medicaid continue to pay Medicare and um, the 20% Medicare doesn't cover. So that's why you want to do both if you have Medicare and you're working way off of Medicaid. Um, SNAP, TANF, HUD, all those benefits will decrease with earnings. So it's really important to tell all those agencies if a client's going to work or prompt them to do that. Um, the residential liability, um, if, like I said, if someone's in a group home, their residential liability will increase with their earnings. Um, so it's really important that they're um, 
houses know when they get a job or when they stop a job, so then their Medicaid residential liability will go back down. Their child's SSDI check, as long as the client is receiving their SSDI check, their child will receive the SSDI check, but if they work their way off of SSDI, their child's SSDI will also stop. And that doesn't matter if they have custody. Um, I've had some clients where their child who they no longer have custody of is receiving an SSDI check based on their work record. And when their SSDI check stops, their child's SSDI check stops. So that's real important to know that that's going to happen. Um, and that's usually why they don't want to work their way off of benefits because then their child's also stops. Now, if their child is receiving SSI, then it, it will be changed based on their earnings. Again, Medicaid, the same thing. If they work their way off, then their child could lose their Medicaid. I know I'm going real fast, so please ask questions or take notes. Um, here is SSDI. The impact working has on that check Remember, that's an all or nothing check. So it has a lot of different um, steps to it, and it can be really confusing. So I came up with a stair-step approach to describe it. And I did give um, a copy of all these um, slides so people can have it as a flyer. So um, Social Security looks at someone's gross earnings, both SSI and SSDI. They look at the gross earnings before taxes. And so because employers no longer give pay stubs, it's important to make sure someone is helping the client get their pay stubs from um, the computer system, from the employer. Um, so gross earnings is before taxes. If their gross earnings is under $940 a month, really nothing happens. They stay on this check. Uh, this step and they keep receiving their SSDI check. If they are making over $940, then it can trigger one trial work period month. The they have nine trial work period months. They only get one set of nine trial work period months in the life of their case. And they have nine of them, and if they use all nine within 60 months, they're gone. Now, if you have trial work period months, whether they're making $950 a month or $2,000 a month, they will get to keep their earnings and keep their SSDI check. This is one area that people are very confused about because some clients can think they have nine trial work period months every time they get a job. And that's not true, it's only once. Um, very early in my career when I didn't know all this knowledge, I had a client who started a full-time job. He didn't report his earnings to Social Security because he thought he had all nine of these trial work period months left. And he had used them early in his life of his work career. And when he finally reported on the ninth month, he found out he did not have those and he had to pay back all nine um, of his SSDI checks, which scared him and he actually quit his job. So it's really important that you find out from Social Security exactly how many trial work period months a person has left. Um, you look at the amount of 940 and you might say, oh, well, this client's never worked very much. They should have them all. But early, even in the 90s, 1990, um, the amount that would trigger a trial work period month was only $200. In the very beginning, it was $50. If someone made $50 a month, they used a trial work period month. So those amounts are more reasonable now, but it's real easy that someone has used them and not realized they've used them all. So that's one thing you can get that information from Social Security and find out for sure how many people, what they have left. Okay, so even once someone has used all their trial work period months, 
oh, wrong way. Then Social Security looks at something called substantial gainful activity. This is the trigger where your check can actually is at risk of stopping. It's gross earnings again over $1,310 per month. There is a higher amount for statutory blind. Now um, that amount is $2,190. The thing to think about is statutory blind is actually an indicator on someone's social security record. And you may have a client that has very low vision or no vision and you think they would definitely qualify for this statutory blind indicator, but I've had many situations where someone would qualify for it, but it's not indicated on their record. Maybe when they first were approved, their vision was lower or they just didn't mark it. And so then they're using the other amount. Um, again, I've seen that for people and I've tried to get their indicator changed early in the process when I did the benefits plan, but Social Security would not change it or even review it until the person gets a job. So that is important to know if someone qualifies for it, um, to have their records on hand when they start a job to get that indicator hit. Um, okay, so for substantial gainful activity, this is actually a decision for Social Security and it's determined when their countable gross earnings are consistent. So if just one time a client goes over 1,310, that won't kick them off. But um, look at it very clearly if that is the amount. But also countable. You can lower your countable earnings with work incentives. And it's subsidy and IRWI. So a subsidy is, um, Usually it's an employer accommodation or it could be the job coach. So if there's a job coach on site and let's say the client is making $10 an hour and the job coach is on site with them or provides 10 hours of service per month. So social security will not count the client's earnings that um, hour they're there. So that would be $10 for 10 hours, so $100 um, a month, their earnings would not count, so they can actually make $1,410. The other amount that's a little harder to look at dollar amount is an employer accommodation. I had a client who um, worked as a janitor in a crew on a, in a factory, and the job description had 10 items. Because of his disability, he's not able to perform two of them. And his employer said, that's fine. Everybody doesn't do all 10 anyway. You'll just do more of the other eight and someone else will do those two that you can't do. So Social Security looks at that as he's only required to do eight of the 10 tasks or 80% of the job. So they actually only count 80% of his earnings. So that is really a way someone could make a lot more money and still keep their check. An impairment related work expense, the IRWI, is something out of pocket and that would be a medical um, co-pays, not premiums, but co-pays, doctor appointment co-pays, um, medicine co-pays, or transportation. And that's not, that's really like the, the paratransit bus um, so if someone's paying for that out of pocket, let's say they have to pay um, $100 a month, either for someone to drive them because they can't take the bus or they live where there isn't a bus. And that means Social Security would not count that $100. Now, as you can be thinking, you've got a lot of clients that are getting a subsidy. Maybe they're paying for transportation. Social Security only cares about these work incentives when someone is close to this substantial gainful activity. So if somebody's working $1,000 a month and they're paying, you know, they're only working part of the job, um, then Social Security doesn't care. It's only when it's the 1,310. Um, one other subsidy that can count um, that you can think about 
is if a client is not working at the same speed or need more break or something, not just job tasks, but maybe this client is working at 90% speed. Now it's a form you fill out, you can take it to social security and they will determine if those subsidies apply. But if you have somebody that's maybe just not working the same speed or needs more supervision, then they could apply for that subsidy. But again, it only counts when you're making that 1,310. So I tell people to remember, if you're making over $1,200, it's time to start looking at these work incentives. Um, and again, if any of you have any clients that have questions about this, you know, give me a call. I can give you some general advice. So never hesitate to give me a call. Um, oh, then the other thing is, what if a client does want to work their say, want off of benefits? I've had client do that. I want clients to make the decision to work their way off or stay on and ha have that based on fear. Um, I've had many clients work their way off and if they're not able to maintain that, they're able to get back. The very first safety net is called extended period of eligibility. It lasts for 36 months. Now this safety net starts when they've used that ninth trial work period month, whether they're working or not. Um, I've had clients that you know work part-time for maybe 10 years. I've actually had a client that did this. He worked part-time for about 10 years. So he used all of his trial work period months. He used his 36 you know, months of this extended period of eligibility. And then he decided, I want to work part-time. I want to go full-time. And so he actually used the second safety net. I'll tell you about in a minute. But this happened. So while he was working part-time, this safety net can expire. So in that 36 months, if you're working over that substantial gainful activity, that's at 1,310, then you will not receive your SSDI check. But if you're under that, you will receive your check. So in that case, if you're working full-time, like I had a client, first thing, got a full-time job, the first nine months, his trial work period month worked, and he got his SSDI check in that 10th month, his check stopped. So if any time in that next 36 months that he wasn't able to maintain full time, either whether he goes down part time or he loses his job, then he can go back in because his case stays open for those 36 months. Even if he's not receiving a check, his case stays open. But to get that, but my second client who worked part time for 10 years, his extended period of eligibility expired when he was working part time. So he went full time at that. He knew it was going, he'd gotten the information. He knew his check was going to stop, but he was okay with that. He wanted to try to work full time. His SSDI check was based on his own work record. I think it was about, this was quite a few years ago, it was like $800. So it wasn't a lot over the SSI check. So he worked full time. He worked full time for 18 months. And at the end, at the 18 months, he was having a lot of problems with his disability. He wasn't stable. He wasn't able to maintain um, working full time. So he um, ended up leaving his job and I actually went with him to Social Security. And we used this last safety net. Um, so for him, that 18 months, his case was closed. As soon as he worked his way off of benefits, when he wasn't able to maintain his work after 18 months, um, we went in and he had this second safety net called expedited reinstatement of benefits. This safety net is for 60 months after his SSDI check ended due to earnings. Um, I've had at least three clients that I know who've done this. So it really does work. We went in and we said, look at he's not able to maintain full-time employment or work over SGA. We would like you to reopen his application, his old case, and 
do the re do his medical review. He doesn't have to be more disabled. He just still had to be this, the same disability he had when he was approved for social security. While they're doing that medical review, he gets up to six months of provisional benefits. And that's the amount of his SSDI check that when it stopped. So he received that. He actually only received it for about two months. Um, they were able to quickly do a medical review. His records were there, um, that he still had a disability. And when he was approved, they recalculated the amount of his SSDI check, because remember, that's how much you pay in. So during those 18 months when he was not receiving an SSDI check, but he was paying in on his full-time job, his SSDI check went up by $300 a month. So that's very much an incentive for someone to try. They can get back on if they can't maintain it, and they may receive a bigger check. So I really encourage people, if they want to try working full-time, they can. Now, I do caution all my clients that this is financially what happens about trying to go full-time. Everybody needs to decide also, you know, physically, emotionally, you know, logistically, can they really work full-time? There's a lot of uh, things that go into deciding full-time, but something that shouldn't be a factor is the fear that they have to go through the whole long process of reapplying. They do have the safety net. Okay. And now this is the impact of SSI. And I tried to explain this. It is complicated. Uh, the really quick answer is the first $85 somebody earns every month doesn't count. And then it's a two for one. For every $2 you earn, your SSI check's gonna go down by one. That's the quick answer. This is the more complicated answer. The first thing Social Security does is they look at any unearned income. That could be a person's SSDI check. It could be if they're receiving child support on themselves, you know, their parents are, but it's for them. Um, maybe there are other money that's coming in um, that is unearned. That has a $20 exclusion. Now then we look at the adjusted earned income, again by gross earnings. If the $20 wasn't used above, then you get that plus the earned income exclusion, which is 65. So that's why I say the first $85 someone earns, they don't count. There's also a student earned income exclusion. This is definitely a lot of people don't know about, and that includes people at Social Security. I've had to educate people at Social Security. This is a very small amount of people who are receiving SSI, but it can be. It's they're under the age of 22 and they're in school. And this includes um, young adult program, as long as they're going 15 hours a week. And I've helped a lot of people do the student earned income exclusion. And that means, you know, up to $1,900 per month um, to a maximum of $7,670 per year is excluded. So really that means if someone's in the young adult program and they're working, they would actually be able to keep their entire SSI check. So if that, if you think that counts for someone, that's definitely, they just have to go in, apply for that, tell them they want it, and usually their IEP from school is all that's needed to show that they're in school. Um, then they have that impairment related work expense that I told you about under SSDI. It's the same impairment related work expense, transportation or out-of-pocket medical. And that is a two for one also. So if somebody had $100 in transportation expenses, then they would able to keep $50 more of their SSI check. There is a blind work expense. Um, it's a lot more things that are included in that, not just transportation and um, medical. There's a lot more, and that's a one for one. So if you had, you were, you know, a client was statutory blind and they had $100 of blind work expense, 
then they would keep $100 more of their SSI check. So we would calculate it, um, again, for every $1 of unearned income adjusted, it goes down by one. For adjusted earned income, it goes down by two. So as you can see, it's pretty complicated, but we have a lovely um, spreadsheet that I can share that you can enter those numbers and you can actually see what happens to someone's SSI check with their earnings. Okay. I'm hoping everybody's here and I actually don't. Yes, everybody is. They are not able to speak during okay. the webinar, but they are hearing you. I didn't know if anybody was chatting. They had questions in chat, but okay. Um, Social Security based on age or being a widow or widower, um, people can work. If they've reached full retirement age, then it has absolutely no impact on their um, Social Security retirement. And SSDI converts to um, retirement, full retirement age. So if someone's on SSDI and they've reached their full retirement age, then work doesn't matter at all. So that thing I told you before doesn't matter at all. If they're under the full retirement age, it's not an all or nothing check. If they reach these annual limits, then they have a two for one or three for one where it goes down kind of like the SSI. So um, that's it. Um, now, what's the impact of moving on benefits? It's really important that if you know if a client is moving, they are contacting all their agencies that they're receiving benefits with a change of address. As some of you may know, um, these agencies send a letter and they give you a very small window to respond. If they're requesting more information, um, we've all probably had clients that lost their Medicaid or lost their food stamps because they didn't respond, but it's because the agency didn't have their address. Um, so that's really important. Um, moving to a different state, I mean, all of our clients are, I think, are within Indiana, but I have talked to people that were considering moving to a different state, and that has a big impact because SSI, even though SSI and Medicaid is kind of a federal program and they have it in all states, different states have different rules and a lot of them would require them to reapply. So that's real important. Um, if they're SSDI, it doesn't matter if they move states, but SSI, Medicaid definitely does. Um, if somebody is living with more or fewer people, um, moving in or out of a group home, nursing home, institutional facility, those things really impact. Um, again, with SSDI, other than giving them a change of address, there's no impact. SSI, remember we talked about that full benefit amount, whether your parent paying the fair share of the living expenses. Um, the way to get that, they basically look at the person's rent or mortgage, utilities, and food. And if that amount, let's say there's three people living there, they need to pay a third of that in rent. Um, if they are paying, um, less than that, then they're not going to get the full benefit amount of SSI. Um, moving on Medicare, again, it has no impact other than we need to change the address. Um, Medicaid, um, if you're moving out of state, that would have an impact. Um, Medicaid waiver, you know, like if they're not living with their parents anymore, that can change services. You guys are the experts of that. Um, the Medicaid residential liability, um, again, that may start or stop if you're moving into or out of a group home. Food stamps, TANF, HUD, that may change also based on the household size. Uh, the child, the client's child's benefits, again, might change um, if you're moving, but definitely need to tell them you have a different address. Um, the impact marriage has on benefits. Um, definitely need to change uh, contact all the agencies with a change of name and notify of a marriage or divorce. Um, again, Social Security has this thing that you're holding yourself out as married. Um, 
and it matters even if the person's not legally married, if they're holding themselves out as married. Um, I had a client, here's a story I tell, um, I actually had a client, you know, you got your smartphone, you got Facebook, and if somebody's phone number is in your contacts, they suggest, hey, do you want to be Facebook friends with this person? Now, I'm not going to be Facebook friends with a client, but it shows up their profile picture. This gal who I just done a benefits plan for, who told me she was not married, had a picture of her in a wedding dress with a groom and bridesmaids and everything. And I'm like, okay, you're telling me you're not married, but I see this picture. Now, if I can see it, maybe other people can. You might want to take that down. I suspect that she might have been married in the church, but not have it recorded with the state. So she wasn't actually ma legally married. But, you know, she told me she had a roommate. You know, Social Security is not going to go in anybody's house and look at what the sleeping arrangements are. But you have to be really careful what that is. Now, um, I had another client who just told me she's still married, but they're not together. And because the SSI amount, if they're married to someone, their income counts. And if that person is also a recipient of SSI, the amount changes because you have a couple. And what happens, they usually split that 1,194. Um, but when she was separated, they're not living together, they have no you know, money together or anything, she was able to get the full benefit amount back. Um, so if somebody is legally married but separated, you can actually get that not the couple amount. Um, being married has no impact on Medicare. It will have an impact on Medicaid based on the spouse's income. Um, I'm not sure what the marriage, because I've never had anybody married getting the waiver or being in a group home, so I'm not really sure how that impacts. Um, if somebody has it, we'll have to look into it. Um, Really, almost everything I know about everything I'm sharing is because I've had a client go through it. So that's why if I knew a client was doing some of this, I would definitely help them get the answers so then I can share that knowledge. Um, if you're married, um, you know, SNAP, TANF, HUD will have an impact on the spouse's income. Um, the child's income really isn't, doesn't, your spouse's income would not impact your child's benefits unless you're actually marrying the other parent of the child. Otherwise, just because you're married, they're not obligated to take care of your child, so your be their benefits don't matter. That is understandable. It's kind of convoluted. Um, so what's the impact children have on your benefits? Um, definitely contact all the agencies when someone has a child or their child reaches 18 or leaves high school. Um, because is there child support received for the child? That matters. So if your client is getting child support for their child, that is not counted as their income. So that's something. Um, but if a client is receiving SSDI, and has a child, their child might actually receive a check on the client's work record. Um, SSI, um, you know, really isn't affected. If your child, um, for Medicare, your child may start receiving Medicare after 24 months of them receiving SSDI. Although I did have a client who was receiving SSI and Medicare. And I'm like, well, how can that happen? And how it happened is the parent was receiving SSDI on their work record, but the amount they were receiving was, and what they paid in was not high enough for their child to receive an SSDI check, but it was enough for their child to get Medicare on their record. And so I've only seen that once. That was a real unique case, but that was the reason. So that could happen. Um, your child may qualify for Medicaid. Um, 
Again, Medicaid waiver and residential liability, I've never had a client receiving those benefits that have a child, so I really don't know, but definitely need to tell them. Um, SNAP and TANF will change the amount if you add a new child. Um, HUD, it may actually change the apartment size you're eligible for if you have a new child. Um, and those that client's child and may change when they received 18. So if a child, you know, if someone's receiving SSI under 18, and then they go through that age 18 redetermination. So, you know, definitely it could impact that. It's not what I wanted. Okay, um, this is something that I think case managers need to be more aware of because um, this can happen long after vocational rehab is involved if somebody's working or maybe even not working, so they really haven't had a benefit plan. They're receiving SSI and their parents have retired or they became disabled or they even passed away that your client may start receiving an SSDI check. If the client is um, becomes disabled before the age of uh, 22, then they could receive Social Security based on the parent's work record. So often, the child's record has the parent's social security number on it, so it should trigger when their record opens. But I've seen a couple times where this didn't happen. So if the um, client's parents retire, become disabled, or pass away, um, also, is there a change of payee or legal guardian if something happens to the parent? Um, will there be a new living situation needed if the client's no longer able to live with their parents? Um, those are questions you have to ask when things happen to the parents. So as far as benefits, again, they may qualify for an SSDI check if something happens to the parents. Um, the SSI may change because they may not be paying or they may now have to pay their fair share of living expenses. So if a person isn't getting the full benefit amount and then they have to move with a roommate or maybe with a sibling or something, they may change that amount of SSI check. Um, again, Medicare, if they qualify um, for Medicare after receiving SSDI for 24 months, um, Medicaid doesn't really change unless the household income changes. Um, Medicaid waiver, if something happens to the parents, they may qualify for additional services. Um, SNAP, TANF, HUD, that could change. Um, if household changes, and again, their benefits. Um, if the client's parents pass away, it won't change their child's benefits unless, you know, they've given up custody. So that's a real convoluted case again. So, um, but definitely if something happens to the parents, you want to talk to all these agencies to see how it changes. Uh, I think that's something definitely that gets missed. So that's why I'm glad I have the opportunity to tell everybody today. Okay, um, the impact money has on all their benefits. Um, did they receive an inheritance, back pay, other large sums of money? Um, they can spend it, um, which isn't always wise, or they can put it in an ABLE account or special needs trust. Um, this is something that I see all the time where, um, you know, people are so, oh, well, you now have over that $2,000, you need to spend it. And so they go out and buy stuff that they really don't need, but they want to make sure they maintain that Medicaid um, SSI check, so they spend it. Now they can put it in an ABLE account. One of the, um, the bank that usually handles ABLE account are the fifth, third bank. Um, I think there might be some other ones, but that's the big one um, that does it. And there's a lot of things you can use for the ABLE account. They can actually take that money and pay rent. Um, they can, you know, do a lot of things with that money. Um, you know, they can't use it to go to McDonald's and, you know, swipe their card, but um, they can save up a lot more money. 
And the money that's in an ABLE account or a special needs trust is not um, counted against their, um, you know, resource limit for Medicaid and SSI. So I can give you a lot more information about those accounts, but that's something they can do. Um, has there been a change in banks or names on bank accounts? That's definitely something that you need to tell um, these agencies that are giving you money because I've seen that happen. Um, SSDI and Medicare has no impact with receiving money because it's what you paid in, what they earned or what their parents earned. So having this money doesn't count for that. But if they're receiving SSI or receiving Medicaid, they can lose it. Um, if it's a back pay, they have some time to spend it, but it's again, better to have a plan and maybe put some of it in an ABLE account. Um, or if people, you know, I when I do benefits plans and I'm talking to parents, I do talk about a special needs trust if they wanna do that um, with their will and, you know, talk to their lawyer or whatever, um, because I've had a client uh, early in my career, I didn't know about a special needs trust and her parents, um, her father passed away and left her $10,000 and the mom didn't want her just to spend it. So because she had $10,000, she lost her Medicaid. We all know one medical crisis, $10,000 isn't anything. Um, so it is important to do something with it. Of course, this was before the ABLE account. Now I'd say put it in the ABLE account. Um, they can put up to $15,000 a year in an ABLE account and still keep their check. Um, Medicaid waiver, again, if they're over resources, they could lose their Medicaid waiver. Um, the Medicaid residential liability will increase if they have this large sum of money. Um, SNAP, TANF, HUD will go down. Um, yeah, we'll be well. Their child's SSI and Medicaid could also be impacted if they receive a large sum of money. And that's it. So I have a little time, not a whole lot of time for questions. But again, this is my phone number. Uh, this is my email. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me with any kind of questions. Um, but um, I'm happy to answer questions now. Okay. Um, so basically, um, sorry. Someone had asked about, you know, when you start getting SSI benefits and. Um, you're not getting full benefit amount because you're getting um, the in-kind support. Um, and they were just curious about, you know, how do families go about doing that? Basically, they just need to call Social Security and let them know that the individual is now paying rent to the family. Um, and then Social Security will increase the benefit. And it's been my understanding that they will retro back a couple months if you say they've been paying for a few months. Correct. Yes. Um, yes. Um, usually they'll want like a copy of, um, you know, utility bills and the rent or mortgage, which, you know, look at the actual mortgage, not, you know, what's taken out for taxes or, um, you know, insurance or anything, just what the actual mortgage amount is. And then how many people are in the household um, and just say, OK, this is what those bills are either. You know, this is about what we spend. Usually I'll have them write a little note, a little letter, and um, have the mortgage, you know, receipt of mortgage and utility bills, and have this, okay, well, look, they eat with the family, and we spend about $200 a month in food, and then take that amount and say, you know, there's three people, four people, how many ever people live here, and just divide that and say, we are going to charge them rent of this amount. Okay. Um, and then somebody asked if the payback will then affect their threshold am uh, amount. I mean, typically, if you've been, if they've been getting benefits for a number of years and they just start paying rent, they're not going to retro back to the start of their benefits. It's only going to retro to the date they started paying rent, correct? Yes. And I don't know how, really how far back they go. Usually when I help people, they're just looking going forward. You know, right. Like, okay, starting um, July 1st or August 1st, they're going to start paying this amount. I know that I can speak from personal experience. Um, when my son turned 18 
and we waited three months because you need to wait three months before you apply for social security benefits for somebody when they turn 18 um, or else they will count parent parental income um, that when he started getting his benefits they of course gave us the reduced amount because of in-kind support but then when we said he's you know he's paying rent this is how much he's paying they retroed back to they retroed back to the start of his three months or when he started getting benefits which mm -hmm. was just a couple months for us so yeah it, it's actually a pretty easy process um yes. so yeah but they're not going to go back years and years and years no. um uh, and then so, uh, yeah well a lot of um people will um maybe talking to their child to say okay well you need to pay for your cell phone or you need to pay for gas or you need to pay for something else and so you really don't call it rent um so i tell people you can tell your child they're paying a hundred dollars for their cell phone but really you tell social security that's a hundred dollars of their rent you know right um, absolutely they don't ask you what you do with that rent uh -uh. you charge them that if you want to save it put an account for them don't put their name on it, but you know, that's your choice. And, and don't share that with anybody who works in Medicaid or waiver world. <laughs> yeah, don't. Um, but, you know, and some people ask, well, if I start charging my child rent, will I have to, you know, claim that as income? And of course, I'm not a lawyer or tax attorney or anything, but I would say they're just paying their fair share. You're not like, I don't think that counts. <sighs> The feedback I've gotten that that's not really counting as income. Like if you're, you know, have rental property or you know you're renting to so some stranger, they're just paying their share of their living expenses. Yeah, um, I would. Yeah, should probably always talk to an accountant about that. Um, yeah. just to be safe. But I will warn you all: accountants half the time don't know much about Social Security benefits or. Um, because we also run into the rule about the, um, the IRS rule, um, about where if parents become staff for their, for their individual, that their income is not taxable. Um, hmm. I, and so most accountants don't know about that rule either. So yeah, it can get kind of confusing hmm. for people. <laughs> well, um, a lot of people think your social security is not taxable and usually it isn't um right but i had someone that i came across that they're they were they were taking taxes out of their ssdi check and i'm like why are you doing that and they were married and one they'd worked a long time so their ssdi check was rather large but they were right. married and their wife was making good money so ah. it got into the taxable amount so he was having taxes withheld oh wow that's wild um so then somebody asks does household income have any impact on someone's eligibility for ssdi i have an adult who's losing their vision and might be unable to work if their next surgery doesn't help there's fear that the entire household's income um wife and children will impact his eligibility for ssdi okay um not for that. Um, what happens when someone applies for Social Security is first they say, um, is the person making money? Because a lot of people think and lawyers will tell you, you can't work and apply for Social Security. And that's really not true. If you are making under SGA, that's that $1,310. So you can still be working at that amount and apply. If you're making over that, it doesn't matter how disabled you are, if you're making over that amount, you're going to get denied. Um, so then they, if you're making that, they'll say, are you still, are you disabled? When they approve you, then they look at where does the money come from? If you've worked enough money um, or have enough work credits, then you'll get SSDI. If you haven't worked enough work credits, then you'll get SSI. So in this case, if the person's not making over, because um, SSDI and Medicare do not care about resources. It's only SSI and Medicaid that care about resources or what family income is anything. 
So that person's been working for, you know, enough. And you can actually go onto the socialsecurity.gov website and do that my account. And it will tell you whether you have enough work credits or not to qualify for SSDI and what the amount would be. So you can actually see that before you apply. Um, so in that case, no family income matters if he would qualify for the SSDI. Okay. Uh, someone asked if they can share your contact information with clients and guardians. Uh, I will say yes. Um, if anybody gets too much, I'll worry about that. But right now, yeah, share it. I don't mind answering a little questions. I can't give people a lot of specifics until I get the specifics of what they're receiving, you know, and get from Social Security. But, you know, just the other day, somebody called me and I, you know, answer some questions on how to apply for Social Security. Um, and just FYI, there's, if you go to the socialsecurity.gov website, you can search on Blue Book, and that is actually what the Disability Determination Board looks at, looks for when they're looking for somebody to be approved. And when people are denied, it's not Social Security saying you're not disabled, it's saying you don't have the medical evidence. So then that does lead to a question that I don't know if you perhaps know, um, because obviously Indiana changed Medicaid eligibility that as long as you're found medically disabled by SSI, you automatically qualify for Indiana Medicaid. How have you found, have you had any experience with like, because sometimes we have issues with kids, um, because obviously they're living with parents, income is too great, whatever, according to Social Security. So they'll say, well, you're not SSI eligible. Um, have you had much experience with that? I have only dealt with adults. Um, I wonder if it would be, because I've seen some where they're eligible, but they're in no pay status. And that right. happens with somebody in a group home because they're not going to receive an SSI check because Medicaid's paying their living expenses. You know, they have right. a residential liability. Um, so I would say apply because um, we could then see if they're qualified. I, I don't really know. I, I can't answer that because I've never had anybody go through that because I've always worked with vocational rehabilitation. Right. So the person is 16 at least. Most of them are over 18. <laughs> um, yeah. Very different situation then. Yeah. Yeah. But I um, would think so, they could still apply, be right. found disabled, but then be found not eligible. Because that process, they're, they're not making SGA because they're, you know, six years old. Um, right. And then they'd be found qualified, but then they're not going to receive anything because the parent hasn't opened up their work record. Now, if their parent's disabled or retired or deceased, then right. they could get an SSDI check on the parent's work record. Um, but if they don't qualify for that and there's too much household income that they wouldn't receive SSI, but they've still been found eligible. They're just in a no pay status. Okay. Is my logic. Um, of course, I don't work for them, but that's what I would do. Tell them a plan. <laughs> Um, how does someone utilize your services? Is the first step to make contact with you or visit the website? Um, well, the thing is, I get most, I get my funding through vocational rehabilitation. Um, and so I'm not sure how we could get Medicaid or Medicaid waiver to pay for my services. Um, I know Advocacy Links is working on doing that to get Voc Rehab to pay for right. that and going to help with that. Um, when I worked for an employment service agency, I worked for both ADEC and um, Corvilla in Indiana, northern Indiana there. Um, I've done benefits plans for people that are just receiving waiver and we build waiver that hourly just like, you know, the job coach would get. I don't know, unfortunately, how we can pay for my services. So I'm happy to give some free advice. Um, oh, this is Joy. Let me jump in here. 
Um, if people, case managers, are wanting to reach out to Julie to ask questions, it's fine to do that. Julie and I and Michelle will work on figuring out who's going to do what and how the payment for that needs to get done. Uh, we are, as a company, working on becoming Ben's uh, coordinators uh, that can do that whole research and project, um, but uh, we're still kind of in our final phases of um, getting our credentials to do that all on our own. So it's fine at this point to reach out to well, I guess I'm speaking to Advocacy Link staff at this point because I know there's a few people on the call that are not our employees, and so they would need to reach out to you separately, the non-staff, um, to to figure out how that would need to move forward. But Advocacy Link staff can reach out to Julie, and then Julie, if you wouldn't mind just touching base with Michelle and I on okay. the Advocacy Link specific cases, just to figure out you know, is this something that we need your specific help with, or if this is something that Michelle or one of the others of us will be working on with them. Does that sound fair? That sounds fair. Okay. Any other questions uh, before we let Julie go? I appreciate your time today. It is after 11, so I don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, good information. Um, Social Security is definitely especially when you get into working and benefits, it gets very complicated. Um, and so I will send out the information that Julie sent. Um, definitely bins are a huge, huge help when you're looking at getting people employed. Um, so I encourage you all, especially as we as at Advocacy Links figure out how to make that happen, um, that we utilize that. So I don't see any further questions coming in. So um, thank you so much for your time this morning, Julie. Great, great information, super helpful. Um, and I really appreciate your time. Yeah, well, you're welcome. I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak to everyone. All right, well, you have a wonderful holiday weekend. Yeah, thank you. All right, and advocacy staff, we will go to 